The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a prospector droid is sorely disappointed when he discovers his mail-order robot bride isn't into exchanging parts. He maybe should have known when he found out her name was A2AD. That's military strategy humor, I'm told. <laughs> Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have part one of a two-part interview with Sharon Lee and Steve Miller discussing their new short story collection, a Leaden Universe Constellation Volume 4. The Constellation Volumes are collections that bring together all the short fiction of Sharon and Steve, everything written in the Leaden Universe outside the novels. This one has some great and touching stories and novellas, and even a nice holiday story, even though I don't think Christmas ever comes on Sure Bleak, although it's certainly always winter. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now here's the news. Hey, I wanted to give you a heads up on our July Bane contest. This one starts the first of the month. And it'll give you a chance to win a free hardcover signed by John Ringo and Mike Massa. That book is River of Night. It's the sequel to The Valley of Shadows and set in John Ringo's Black Tide Rising world. When the zombie plague breaks out, Tom Smith uses his experience as the global managing director for security at an international bank to get himself and his clients to safety out of New York. Which got us thinking, what other career experiences might come in handy in a zombie plague and why? So let us know your answer in a short hundred words or so paragraph. For a chance to win, River of Night, signed by John Ringo and Mike Massa. Details are at the Bain.com website, uh, there on the left-hand column. And if you sign up for the bi-monthly newsletter, you'll find out about all the monthly contests, the eARCs, and all the great books coming out from Bain Books and Beyond. So write us up a little short paragraph that tells us uh, about the best career experience for facing the zombie plague and what those zombie skills might be, and enter to win a river of night. This is part one of a two-part interview with Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, authors of A Leaden Universe Constellation, Volume 4. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Want well, to welcome... Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, back to the podcast. Hello. Hi there. Hi, Tony. So, Maine-based writers Sharon Lee and Steve Miller teamed up in the late 1980s to bring the world the story of Kinzel, an inept wizard with a love of cats, a thirst for justice, and a staff of true power. Though That was a long time ago. Um, since then, the husband and wife team have uh, written dozens of short stories and 20-plus novels, mostly set in the star-spanning Leiden Universe novel uh, series. Uh, before settling down to the serene and stable life of science fiction and fantasy writer, Steve was a traveling poet, a rock band reviewer, reporter, and editor of some community newspapers. Sharon has been an advertising copywriter, copy editor on Nightside News at a small city newspaper, reporter, photographer, and book reviewer. Both credit their newspaper experiences with teaching them the finer points of collaboration. Sharon and Steve passionately believe that reading fiction ought to be fun, that stories are entertainment. Hey, I do too. Steve and Sharon maintain a web presence. You can find all the stuff you need about the Lead and Universe and more at Corval, K-O-R-V-A-L dot com. So uh, Out Now is, um, is a new collection. We've been collecting all of this short stories and shorter work that is in the Leaden Universe in the books called the Leaden Universe, A Leaden Universe Constellation, Volume 1, 2, 3, and now at Booksellers is Volume 4, which, according to your introduction, Sharon and Steve, you predicted... <laughs> yes, we did. We did predict. We can't stop writing short stories. It's terrible. Um, and and since um, you, that is you, uh, the Bain Publishing Company and the Bain Publishing readers 
um, seem to um, appreciate the short stories, and one way or another, they they want to make sure that uh, we want to make sure that uh, these are available. So pulling them get together in one spot makes it easy for for your uh, fans who are not instantly online on 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 every uh, every event. And there's good news, Tony. We've already yes. written two two stories toward volume five. Very good. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I'm- how what was the what was the break between volume three and four in terms of when we put them out? Do you? It was a couple of years, right? It was, it was a few years. It was actually. a few years. We we had slowed down. <clears throat> I I think what happened is that we had uh, collected the volume the volume three and maybe twenty fourteen maybe twenty some somewhere around there, and then we had uh, because of the way the writing schedules uh, for the worked, novels. For the novels and uh, and the fact that we were writing a story to support uh, an extra story, as it were, to support each novel, plus we had a uh, raft of people asking us for stories for anthologies, including you guys, so that all, all together we, we ended up with um, uh, sufficient for for another in about every three or four years, it seems like at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, we Right now we've got... Um, one in, one in process, another short story in process besides the two that Sharon was just mentioning, and uh, I think we owe you one for uh, the upcoming novel. So yeah, we 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 we've been turning out some short fiction in the Lee Aiden universe fairly frequently. It's um, accepting the Lance, right? Is the uh, the, the December Lee Aiden novel? Right, it's the next novel. Yeah, and that's out um, in December. We're uh, we're republishing some of the uh, some of the old uh, Misha Merlin uh, press uh, and such uh, Leon novels. Can you tell us a little bit about that before we talk about uh, the collection? What happened is that after a while, uh, the initial books were not available to people as standalone volumes, and that was being a concern. Some people only wanted, only needed Agent of Change or Conflict of Honors or Carpe Diem. And uh, so as a kind of a 30th anniversary um, follow-on, Agent of Change was uh, was reprinted as a standalone volume so that people uh, new to the uh, series might be able to find it in bookstores as a, rather than having to try to buy two, three, or four books in at once which is what was happening in the uh, omnibus conditions and um so the the reissues began actually last year with um agent of change and then we've had uh and conflict and conflict con- of honors is coming this year um in october i think in, in october and then there should be carpe diem Right. Let's talk about the first story in the collection, which is called Street Cred. Um, and here we have Val Khan, who's been a, a hero of, uh, of recently Aiden novels um, that take place on Sherbleek. Um, and in Street Cred, he has a hit put on him, uh, like a, a, a contract killing. And in Lee Aiden terms, a contract is very important. Um, why is this? How is... Uh, is Corval Malanti involved? What is Malanti anyway? Malanti is which hat you're wearing. Um, if you go if you go to work as an editor, then your um, Malanti is to um, go through the go through the book and have it make sense. Um, if you then go home and you see your kids, and your Malanti is as a father, which doesn't have very much to do with making the books right. Um, so it's it's basically what we do every day, um, except we agents formalize it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and one of the things that has happened on Sherbleek is that we're trying they're trying to meld two very very different cultures. On Sherbleek, the contract is just like, well, yeah, sure, I'll sign your contract until something better comes along. And to the agent, those are fighting words. Um, you could die for doing that. And so what has happened is that a couple of reagents have put out a reagent contract on Valcon because they, they believe that he has created um, grief in their lives um, that would be balanced by his death. 
and they're trying to bring sure bleak justice into alignment with um, liaison balance, and this is something that's ongoing in the book. Yeah, and the cult- the cultures are considerably different. The uh, background for sure bleak is okay. You shake a hand, so you've made an agreement, and liaisons wouldn't think or at least originally, wouldn't think on doing some, something quite so uh, casually. They would have a, a keandra, that is a, a lawyer or attorney, whatever a, equivalent, go over everything very, very carefully to make sure who was responsible for what, what the penalties would be for failure to follow through, et cetera. And uh, trying to put the uh, rather casual uh, Terran cultural base uh, into a um, into a place where they can work with the Liadans who are beginning to flood the planet uh, in order to get away from Liad. Uh, it, it, there's a quite a bit of of conflict available there. Yeah, and the contract has been put out by uh, some some Liads, um, I guess you call them, who have been who feel that they they need to uh, get get some recompense, and there's money on it. And on Surefleet, on Surebleak, the money causes people to say, "Okay, we're going to go do this." And then, what is it they they do or try to do? Well, they they try to put a hit out on the boat boss, which is a really dumb idea. As as, as the person who accepts the contract says, it was a really dumb idea. Except it was a contra. And that's a whole lot of money. And she has to go to the road boss and say, um, look, I did this really dumb thing. I accepted a contract um, to hit you guys, and I don't want to do it. How do we get out of this? And one of the things they've been trying to do on Sherbleek is to grow up what's called, what they're calling street Kiandra. Kiandra are the people on Liad, the kind of accountant lawyer people who keep track of balance and contracts. And these are, there are teams, one Liadian and one Karen, who are trying to balance Liadian contract language and sure bleak ethics to create a new kind of code of law. Hmm. The, uh, the problem uh, is kind of doubled in this this situation because the contract uh, being on uh, the road boss, as it were, it's actually named, Valcon is actually the named, um, one of the named parties, but Miri is part of the road boss too, the same way she is part of Delm of Corval. So it gets complicated who exactly is in, who exactly is involved in this. Uh, the further complication is that the Liadans involved are ha- have hired a major firm on Liad to write this particular contract, and there seems to be some consideration that the contract is ill-formed. Well, not that the contract is ill-formed necessarily, but that it ought ever to have been written, that that there was no basis for a contract in this particular complaint. Um, so there's there's ethical and um, legal and um, humanitarian um, problems going on here. Um, yeah. So this partic- particular thing sets sets the stage for how we're going to continue in Shrub Week um, forming forming a um, graded society. Well, let's I mean, let's give a little background. What is the, why? What was the offense? The offense was that the that Corval bombed the planet to get rid of the Department of Immunity. Is it the right? The, they they um, put a hole in the home world in in order to smoke out um, a very bad agency that was going to take over Liad. And and also by by what once that agency had uh, started uh, 
a device. The device was, in fact, a danger to the entire planet. So what was happening was the uh, the people from in in orbit uh, shot a hole in the planet and took out uh, a, a war machine that could have ended up killing the entire planet. And in in the way of such things, no good deed going unpunished. Um, Corval for this act of heroism and saving the planet is banished, and that's why they're on Treblik. And and that that bomb uh, bombing of the super weapon or whatever it might have been is um harmed uh, others and they were collateral damage right that's and that's the that's the basis for the contract and the contract right. is that both of these people both of these people have lost people um due to that action of Corvold. but then it gets retranslated when it gets to uh Sherbleek into local terms it becomes personal. Okay, you have a personal gripe against the road boss. Now, how we solve these things, these sorts of things on Shrublik is we get personal. Choose a knife. Here is my knife, says the guy who has been a corner man, which is a dispenser of rough justice in the Terran society on Shrublik. Here is my knife, and here is my boss's knife. You choose either one of these. And we'll bring the road boss in here, and you can settle this. Because um, on Shorebleek, uh, Shorebleek has has a history that any any major fight is basically between you and me. And if somebody's working for me, and they they I send them after you, they're after you. They're not after your sister. They're not after your brother. They're not after your uncle. And so if they take you out. It's over, and if you manage to survive, okay, it should be over. Uh, in this case, the the uh, contract from Liad doesn't offer any opportunity for 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 that kind of an arrangement. The contract from Liad is just um, kill these guys, kill them, and that that's the only option available. And it's not it's not personal. Um, there is no. Uh, and so that's the kind of interface that has to be brought, that we're, we're dealing with an entirely different culture, and yeah. the, uh, that's the question that needs to be settled is, uh, how do we do this here? And it comes down to what's an appropriate balance. Is the death of the road boss um, balance enough for the loss of your, of your sister? I think one of the people had lost a sister. Um, and it comes down to, or is you know, if you kill me, you kill me now and I'm dead, is making me live out the rest of my life um, regretting this action which I, have been do- which I have been doing, regretting this action every morning for the rest of my life, is that maybe better balance? Well, it's got a very poignant um, conclusion that uh, after a lot of action, uh, it's, a, it's a great little story. And Valcon is the, uh, the delm, right, of Corval in, in this time frame. He and his life mate are together, the Delm. Uh, who is Mira? Yes. Who is Mira? So, well, all right, that's street cred. Um, the story after that is called Due Diligence. It's another contract story. <laughs> you guys like to... Um, if, if you recall, and, and people who are familiar with the will remember that uh, Leadens go to the point of having contract marriages. And uh, so contracts, again, contracts are very, very important to Lee Aidens, and they, a lot of the stuff is done on the dotted line very carefully. So for Gunn, uh, I forget, he's, I, he's, uh, he's from a, a, not Corval, but another... Uh, he's from a very, very tiny clan, <clears throat> which is basically, basically pirates. Um, his, his cousins are not very nice people. And he's not very good at reading contracts, apparently, <laughs> as we start. He's real good at math, but he doesn't read very well. So, and he's never had to read very well because his cousins figure stuff out for him. Yeah. So what's the problem as we begin the story? Well, the, hmm. prob- the problem is that Fergun um, has noticed some discrepancies in how his cousins, he's being pilot for his cousin's business, 
and he's noted some discrepancies in how his cousins have been doing business, and he has a couple of questions. And the cousins decide that that is very dangerous and they need to get rid of him. So they have him sign a contract, and they turn him loose on, on uh, false interest report on Liad. Um, and then they call in information about him to the port authorities who come and find him with this contract um, doing stating illegal things. And they haul him up before the portmaster, and the portmaster takes his license. And the only thing he knows how to do to make money is pilot. So he's in the position of, yeah, go ahead. He's, he's now abandoned on this foreign port where he knows nobody with no way of making money. And he can't get his license back until he shows himself to be law-abiding for a year. But he can't make the money to pay his fine without having his license. Right. <coughs> so it's a, it's a real catch-22. And and um, it turns out that um, a uh, wide-awake uh, member of Clan Corval who's, who's in need of a pilot um, to help her uh, continue her clan. Uh, the, the story here is one that is backstory for a lot of the, in effect, for a lot of what happens with Falcon and Miri and all of that, because we we had not previously find it, found out in uh, on camera, as it were, uh, who Davios Valium's father was. Just to say Valcon's grandfather. Valcon's grand, yes, Val Valcon's grandfather, and uh, the reason this this comes down to things is that uh, uh, in order to be Delm of Corval, uh, you need to be a pilot, and you need to be a first class pilot. It turned out that the first child born to the Delm, Chayu, who Delm Chai Yusfelium was in fact not a pilot, not never going to be a pilot, and that is uh, who the person who is much later seen as Aunt Corrine. Uh, so she is the older sister, and there is there is clear evidence that she is not a pilot. She is never going to make a pilot, and so her mother needs to go out and have another kid, or make sure that there is another kid at the the same time within the clan who can be a pilot and thus can be Delm. And uh, so Chai is in a strange spot of needing to be looking for a um, pilot of some note and merit uh, to be a father and finding somebody who is not already involved in all the clan politics on Liad would be really nice. Well, she finds this guy who is who can't read, but he's a really great pilot. And she basically um, says, I am the answer to all of your problems. Um, if you're married to me for a year, you are demonstrating um, good faith. You will be lawful or I'll wring your neck. Um, and, and all of your problems are solved. I'll feed you, I'll close you, I'll help you, my husband, and help me get a kid. Easy, right? Well, perhaps not if you're uh <laughs> <laughs> yes if if you're dealing with clan Corval at all um there's going to be complications yeah and because this guy is unlettered, they decide to um do consummate um most of the time of the marriage um off world so she set she sets up a trade a small trade route for him, which is easy for her to do because she's from a family of traders, um, and sets about redeeming him and also teaching him how to read contracts. As due yeah. diligence, due diligence, you have to read your contract. So that's it's yeah, a redemption that's, story. It's not a contract story. That's my favorite scene when she says, read the damn contract. <laughs> he won't read his own contract. It's cool. Um after that, we have um, Friend of a Friend, uh, the next story, which is um, uh, Vili and Quinn. Quinn is the, the, is the Liaden guy, um, and Vili is a, is a Terran? Or what is the, their relationship? Okay, the, to say we have Vili and Quinn, however, is, is a kind of a difficult situation because well, the... Quinn, 
two weeks very early in the yeah. spring. Um, the the point the point here is yeah, that Billy and Quinn story. are um, are um, excellent friends, and they um, they care about uh, they care about each other. Quinn is in a spot in his life where he needs to go off planet and get some more get get some more piloting experience, and so uh, he is as the story gets underway being called off planet to go to go pilot. Uh, now Quinn is a um uh a young man with uh, two two different kind of jobs. Uh one in one of his jobs, I'm sorry, Billy is is uh, is somebody with two different kind of jobs. Billy is a uh a dealer. He a, a, six. He he in one of his jobs, this, the the one that he came to later, he is a, a dealer of, of um sticks at uh, the Emerald Casino. But at his job that where he was when, when first met, and I'm going to forget the uh, technical term. Yeah, he's a hetera, that is to say. He's a um, a prostitute for Miss, Miss Audrey. Miss, for Miss Audrey's. Uh, so this is what he's been he's been doing for for some time. He is uh uh he has come to be a member also of the staff at uh, Emerald Casino and thus became friends with Quinn who is the uh boss's son the uh and they have they become they become quite close and Billy has two jobs. Well, but again the action back on Liad keeps coming coming in to shadow over what's going on on Shore Bleak. And uh, at at his day job, that is to say at the casino where he he does he frequently is doing the day sessions, uh, Billy is approached by somebody who wants to know all about his connections with the with the son of the uh, casino and seems to have already discovered bits and pieces of the fact that they are connected. And um, Billy finds this to be off-putting at, at best, but he's got jobs to do, and so he, he does them. Uh, the person does not, however, stop doing uh, bothering him about this and keeps trying to make arrangements to meet with him and to find out more. And uh, Quinn is of the impression... Quinn who knows a lot of people is being presented by this by this woman as somebody known to her as if you know we we share the friendship of we share the information we we share tell me what's he doing now kind of things and billy's very un, unhappy with with this and tries to fob her off uh <coughs> eventually uh while she's in pursuit of the uh the goal which turns out to be quite nefarious uh she shows up at his uh, night job at uh gigolo Audrey's. job at his night at his gigolo job exactly um and asking to buy special services in order that she will have have his attention for a long time and uh things kind of go um downhill from there actually it's uh billy has has the understanding uh, he he is not necessarily a brave person he's not somebody who launches into uh who who goes off carrying weapons of war he that's not who he is but he is but he is a very very good reader of people and he's terrified of this woman and doesn't want to be alone with her and um this, this is the solving that needs that needs to um Happen. Billy has got to um, bring back up to bear in a um, in a very awkward um, kind of situation. Yeah, and because on sure, Blake, there is a sort of it's not it's not that weird Liaden or weird, but <laughs> extreme Liaden uh, uh, attention to protocol. But there's this sort of libertarian contract thing. He's agreed to do this job, and she's paid. And so he's trying not to uh, not do his job. At the same time, he wants to be loyal to to his friend Quinn, right? 
Yeah, yes. he wants to be loyal to his friend Quinn, and he also want, he thinks there's something off. So he appeals mm-hmm. to a higher authority. Um, and it turns out that he's right. It's, he's a very empathic yeah. young man. Yeah. Well, back to uh, back to pilots. Um, let's see. What about uh, well, Thurney Cheers is not exactly a pilot. He he's got a pilot license. He's a winning fellow. I think he's my favorite character in the in the collection, actually. Um, little, little beset by bad luck and bad judgment. What's his problem at the start of Cutting Corners? Well, his problem is he's got a bad boss. Yeah, Thierry Cheers is a uh, uh, <clears throat> somebody who knows about cargo and cargo mastering, and uh, he's also technically uh, a pilot. But he's a, a pilot. He's a third-class pilot. He's a very base-level pilot, and he's a base-level pilot in order that he can help cart things around from one place to another if he needs to as part of the cargo-moving situation. Uh, it's, a, it's an additional, uh, uh, an additional furbelow on his uh, resume that he, can, that he can do these things. And as Cutting Corners starts, uh, Turney's cussing many people out uh, because they've put him into a situation where the cargo go- gate is uh, jamming, and because he's cargo master, the pilot and the uh, the captain are blaming him for the fact that the ship is in wretched shape, and the uh, car- the, the cargo elevator won't work or isn't isn't working properly. And so there's a, a whole lot of um, sorting out going on about not only of whose fault is this, uh, but also the right way to um, to fix it. And Cherney has 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 explained that you know one good way to fix it is that I can take this rather than doing it this way, I can take it out the cargo hold rather than trying to transship it through the through the elevator and through the freight things right here on on the dock we can do this it'll <laughs> cost a little bit of extra money but we can just take it from this end of the roll around run it around the ship and run it where it needs to go without trying to fix this thing uh and um so in the way things work the uh, people on the ship think it's are, are trying to blame him for there being a problem they're more interested in where the blame goes than in fixing the situation. Yeah. And they and just don't one, want to put any way, money in anything, right? No, no, no. They they skipped routine maintenance. Like I think it's like three times or four times, and now they're blaming him because the elevator doesn't work. It's just totally unfair. So on his way to, to the um, dock office to try to rent a boat to move the cargo out through the cargo hold, um, he realizes that, oops, his license has expired because being a pilot is not all that important to him, and he's been on this wreck being the cargo master and hasn't had any need to move a ship. Um, so he has to retest. So this this is basically about his retesting to get his um, third-class license back so he can solve the problem of his former ship and also um, get a look at some irregular going ones on the other side of the space station. Yes, and the reason it's this... For, it becomes his former ship, is that um, because there are complications while he's going off getting his piloting certificate re-upped, um, they've decided that he's just being far too much trouble, and um, they end up deciding to hire a ship to do exactly what he had said. And after all, if they fire him, they'll be able to use the money that he would have been paid to help pay for this for this ship thing, so for this transship, so he he's kind of in a in a um, bad spot. Also abandoned. Well, yes, I guess you could you could call it abandonment, and um, the follow on and this this is something of of note to people who've been following the series for a long time. Uh, there is a character who appears in this story besides Therney, uh, Charles, um, there is a character who appears in this theory who story who later shows up in a very uh, short but important role in 
one of our Theo books. Okay. Who, which one is that? Is that the uh, captain that he's flying with, or is that the uh, the the one that gives him his second chance? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Who it? She didn't have to arrange it for him, but um, it, she just felt like he'd been a little put upon, perhaps. Yeah. Well, she, the, 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 yes, the, the captain of bees lady is, is somebody who, who believes if you can do it, you can do it. And, um, her ship is custom, has been, um, custom rehabbed out of something that was supposed to have been thrown away. Never been able to fly. And, uh, so she, she's got this thing built. And if a guy needs, uh, if a guy needs to have his chance to prove that he can pilot, she's up to it. And, uh, in the doing of that, in him taking his test, he he finds himself ha- having to um, <laughs> avoid problems that he shouldn't have to uh, avoid. He finds himself in the midst of a sm- smuggling loop of of stuff, and then they've got to solve. It's again, there's a solving going on. He's got to solve. What do I do now? And rather than risking the ship, he in effect. Ends the ends the test right now. I'm going to do this. This is what I have to do. And Beast Lady's uh, pilot is right with him, saying, "Okay, this is what we do. You follow this. You've done this. You've done right." Um, and uh, the complication comes again, as as it does in a number of our stories, in the paperwork. Yep, paperwork. Demons in the paperwork. That was part one of a two-part interview with Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, authors of A Leaden Universe Constellation, Volume 4. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. I think the overseer might join us when the time comes, Keita whispered to his fellow conspirators. He strikes me as the master's man, Baldov said. I wouldn't trust him. I don't know. He seemed truthful. I think he's had enough of the law. Same as us. The overseer's words are worth salt water. Govin's teeth were visible in the dark when he grinned. Besides, he's given me the whip one too many times for no good reason. He's getting his throat cut, same as the rest of the master's pets, when the time comes. There was a constant low level of noise in the bunkhouse, as was bound to happen when you packed over two dozen castless men, women and children into one shack, so they weren't too worried about being overheard. There were many other bunkhouses just like this one on Master's Lands, and each one had its own conspirators as well. When the time comes, we keep talking about that like it's the return of the forgotten. Baldev was casual about his blasphemy. If this protector is on his way because of us, the time needs to be now. We need to strike soon. 
The dirt floor was covered in straw. Everyone slept on top of their personal belongings to keep them from getting stolen during the night. Keita rolled over on his meat cutter's apron to stare at his friend. Are you mad? We're not ready. There aren't enough of us. The master's house only has a hundred warriors. We've got twice that now. Have you been out in the sun too long, Govind? Keita was actually surprised the fisherman could count that high. Your duty is to mend the nets. That's all you do. Sleep, eat, shit, screw, and mend nets, and then complain about mending nets to us before you repeat it all the next day. Your whole life you've worked on nets. How good at you are mending nets? I'm really good at mending nets. So if I grabbed any two men here and sent them to the beach tomorrow, they together would be able to handle nets as good as you by yourself? Of course not. Takes time. Exactly, stupid. The warrior caste's only duty is to fight and train to fight. That's all they do. That's all they care about. You hear them on the other side of that fence, hitting each other with wooden swords from dawn to dusk. They're as good at their duty as you are at yours. No, we wait until we have enough to overwhelm the house all at once. And then, when we win, and we win fast and clean, all of the castless in this province will rise up and kill their warriors too. Baldev was the strongest, but he knew Keita was the smart one. And there's so many of us that even the other houses won't be able to do a thing. This province is the arse end of the land. We've got cursed oceans on three sides. The other houses are too busy fighting each other to send an army to deal with us, and by the time they do, we'll have formed our own army, a real castless army. Only then, we won't be castless anymore. We'll be whole men like them, and even the law will have to recognize us. Just because you're the only one of us who can read makes you think you're so smart. Govin snarled. You steal one of the master's books about strategy, and you think you're such an expert. You're a dreamer. The book had merely given him new ideas. Govind had no notion of just how much of a dreamer Keita really was. They were focused on freeing themselves, but Keita wanted to free all of the castless in every province. He wanted to see the great houses in flames. And though they weren't allowed to speak of the old ways or practice any of their traditions, Keaton knew in his heart that the forgotten was real, and though they had abandoned their god, their god would never abandon them. We keep doing what we're doing, find more like us, willing to fight and smart enough to keep their mouths shut. When the day comes, we'll know. Soon, my friends. It'll be very soon. Govind grunted. Fine. We'll wait then. And while we wait, this protector will show up, breathing fire, kill us all, eat our souls, and we'll be so much better off. I'm going to sleep. Keita lay on his back, stared at the logs of the ceiling, and tried to ignore the screaming of hungry babies. Baldev waited a minute before whispering again, What are we going to do about the protector, Keita? Nobody will talk. Our plan is safe. And if it's not, they'd all heard stories about what the protectors of the law were capable of. The protectors are only men, Baldov. They're only men. You are wrong. Keita woke up with a start. He sat up in the straw, and his first instinct was to move his hands about to make sure no one had stolen his belongings or the meager amount of food he had stashed. It took him a moment to regain enough sense to understand that it was very late and the bunkhouse was too quiet. The snoring, grunting, and farting of the packed-in bodies seemed muted, like his ears were plugged. But he'd heard a voice. Keita looked around and flinched as he realized somebody was sitting in the straw behind him, only a few feet away. The protectors are more than men now. It is best to think of them as a one-man army, or perhaps a one-man inquisition. They are warrior monks of the highest caste, 
whose bodies and minds have been broken by hardship and reformed by magic, and if one of them is trying to kill you, then you will more than likely die. Keita slowly put one hand on the handle of his cleaver. Squinting, he tried to make out the visitor's features in the dark. The stranger was very old, probably forty years at least, thin even by castless standards, and dressed in fabric made of the coarse woven fibers common to one of their station. Who are you? Someone who has been listening to your plotting and been rather amused by it. Our people were thrown down forty generations ago. Do you really think in all those years you are the first who has thought he could destroy the law? Quiet, Keita hissed. The old man wasn't even whispering. He scanned the room, but everyone appeared to be asleep. Are you trying to get us killed? You are doing a fine job of that without any help from me. Besides, none of them can hear us. We may speak freely. Keita snorted. What? Are you supposed to be a wizard or something? Yes, Keita the Butcher. Something like that. I am Ratul, the Keeper of Names. And I've come to help you shake the foundations of the world. Keita did not speak of the strange visitor to anyone, especially his fellow conspirators. They would have either thought he was mad, or that it was some sort of elaborate ploy to expose them. But a keeper of names? They were a tale that castless mothers would tell their children to give them enough hope to sleep at night. Even talking of the Forgotten's clergy was a violation of the law. Only a babbling madman would claim to be one. Yet Keita had to know the truth. The next night, he waited for everyone assigned to his shack to fall asleep before sneaking out the back window. His sandals didn't make much noise on the grass. There were so few warriors here that he wasn't worried about being seen. But even if he was, he'd never been caught violating curfew before and more than likely could plead his way out of it by saying that he was going to visit one of the women assigned to a different shack. He'd probably only get a beating to show for it, at worst. As much as the higher castes would never admit it, Keita suspected he was too valuable at his duties to start chopping his limbs off for such a minor infraction. He did the work of a butcher and a storekeeper, and it would take far too long to teach another castless to read the inventory ledgers. The tide was high. The surf was crashing against the black rocks. Ratul was waiting for him there. The madman did not turn to look as Keita approached. Did you know that in the days before the sky opened and the demons fell from the heavens, that man actually moved across the waters in great vessels? That's foolishness. The ocean was pure evil. There were only two things to be found in the ocean, death and fish. And fish were only good to feed to the castless, as whole men would never touch something tainted by unclean salt water. Why would anyone do such a thing? Because we are not alone. Or maybe we are now. But we were not then. There are other lands, as big or bigger than this one, and isles, so many isles, thousands of them in between. Keita knew that there were islands. On a clear day, some could be seen on the horizon. He remembered a time, many years ago, when some of the castless decided to try to make it to one. A false prophet had a vision, saying they could go live in a place beyond the law's reach and be whole men there. He said the Forgotten would protect them during their journey. Many fools had gone with him on their pathetic, cobbled-together boat, while the rest had watched, curious, along the shore. Of course, the demons had come from the deep and consumed them, and the master of the house had laughed and laughed at the foolishness of his non-people. There used to be trade of ideas, things, animals, and crops. Men explored and settled and made new lives and bore children who do the same. Now that the demons own the sea, I wonder if those other lands have become as dark and isolated as this one 
or if they still live at all. Here, Ramroan pushed the demons back into the sea. Maybe the Forgotten didn't send other lands such a hero. He had heard so many conflicting myths and stories, but this was new. Ram Rowan? They've done such a fine job, stomping out our history here. Ratul looked at Keita for the first time. When our god defeated the demons in the war in heaven, they fell here and began a great slaughter. Mortals could not slice the hide of a demon, so God sent one of his generals to the world to protect us. It was Ramroan who united all the houses and pushed the demons back into the sea. Thus Ramroan became the first king. We built a great temple at the spot where he fell to the world, and a city sprung up around it. It is still the capital today. The law says that there are no gods and no kings, Keita said suspiciously. There is no temple in the capital, and there is certainly no king over the houses. The law did not exist then. In those days, there were prophets who taught God's will. After Ramroan died, the prophet said that the demons would return again, and only the blood of Ramroan would be able to smite them. If this bloodline died out, we would all perish with it. The sons of Ramroan were to defend us, and their bloodline could never die, or we would be defenseless before the demons. They each took a hundred wives, and had many more sons who each took many more wives. Their lives were sacred, and far more important than lesser men, so the first of the castes was born. There have always been castes, Keita insisted. I read it in a book. Huh. You can read. I knew that I chose well. No butcher. The sons of Ramroan were the first caste, and as time went on, other castes were created to serve their whims. First were the workers, then the warriors, then the merchants, and most of the others that we still have today all of them created to see that every desire of the sons was granted. All wealth was theirs to take. Any woman they desired was granted as another wife, because what are the wishes or property of any one house compared to our eternal security from the demons? The priests enforced the will of the ruling caste. They began to replace their god's teachings with the desires of the sons of Remroan. As the numbers of the first caste grew, so did their greed and pride. We will rise up and kill them all, Keita spat. They are still horrible today. Yes. Ratul turned back to the waves. Yes, they are. He sighed. Things changed over the generations. The priests began to forget their god, and the prophecies were merely tools to gain riches. The church and the sons of Ramroan became one and the same, and the priests even bore their name. Eventually, the great houses grew in unbelief, until they only saw the priesthood as oppressors. The sons of Ramroan, who had grown fat and indolent, were no match for the brutal warrior caste they'd created to protect them. The great houses were so angry, they destroyed the church and killed every priest they could find. The temples were burned and the statues were smashed. The law was written to correct the excesses of the first caste, but it went too far. It declared there was no before and no after, so it only set in stone the corruption. And thus, our God was forgotten. You claim to be of the old priesthood. Keita didn't know what to believe. Why are you telling me this, Ratul? Because the protector of the law isn't coming here for your pathetic rebellion. He is coming here for me. Govind, the netmender, was at his left, and Baldev, the stone lifter, was at his right. Today they were not castless netmenders, stone lifters, or butchers. They were soldiers, 
and they were striking back against the house that had kept a boot on their faces their entire lives. Twenty more castlers were crowding against the doorway behind them, eager to begin. This is what it must feel like to be a whole man. The sound of woodcutters' axes falling on sleeping heads was far louder than expected. The warriors' barracks were coming to life. Men were springing from their beds. The warrior cast got actual beds. And taking up their swords. Kill them all! Tita lifted his meat cleaver and hurled himself, screaming at the nearest rising warrior. He lashed out and caught the warrior's wrist as he reached for his sheathed sword. The stump came back, pumping red. Keita snarled and hacked away. Steel parted flesh, opening the warrior's neck clear to the vertebrae. And he flopped back into his blankets. Keita never killed a man before, but he found they died not so different than butchering a pig. Until they fought back. The warriors collected themselves far too quickly, and then their swords were slicing back and forth through the darkness. They stood shoulder to shoulder, each one knowing what to do because they'd practiced together for thousands of hours. A handful of assassins rushed them, and castless blood splattered the walls and pumped out onto the floor as a result. Another group hit, but the warriors split the wave like a cliff rock. They were a wall of steel. The warriors' backs were to a stone wall. Keita had expected this would happen. They needed to be pulled into the open so Keita could surround and crush them with superior numbers. Outside! Everyone run! Keita slipped in a puddle, but then Baldov had him by the arm, hoisting him and carrying him back toward the door. Run! Of course the warriors gave chase because that was what a predator did when its prey fled. Even naked and barely awake, the warriors didn't hesitate. They rushed out the door after the assassins and right into the waiting spears and hurled rocks of a castless mob. The pursuing warriors had not expected so many foes, and they died quickly as a result. There were other barracks, but they were made of wood, so they'd been set on fire. As the coughing warriors tried to come out, they were shoved back with spears, impaled or burned. The manner of their deaths didn't matter. Keita didn't care. Only that they all died. Keita climbed on top of a barrel so that everyone could see him. He waved his bloody cleaver overhead. Tonight, we show them we are whole men to the master's house. If everything had gone as planned, the master would already be dead, throat slit by a castless pleasure woman who was part of the conspiracy. But Keita didn't want to dampen his new army's enthusiasm. Onward! Drag him from his hiding place and hang him on the punishment wall! Govind bellowed as he brandished the dead overseer's whip. The mob surged toward the master's house. Other warriors would be waiting, and these would be alert, ready, and possibly armored. But there would be no stopping the tide of blood tonight. Keita hopped down from the barrel. The hand fell on his shoulder, so hard and strong, that at first he thought it had to be Baldov, but instead, it was the frail old Ratul, the supposed keeper of names. What are you doing? he demanded. Creating an army, creating a future. All the time I spent teaching you the old ways, and you've learned nothing, hot-blooded fool. Ratul pointed toward the gateway of the master's house. You've doomed them all. Shadows created by several torches bounced wildly across the stone walls. There was a lone figure silhouetted in the entrance, blocking the way. Keita had to squint to see. There was a man, tall, broad of shoulder, just standing there, without so much as a tremble before the rushing mob of furious bodies. He had a forward curving sword in one hand, the tip resting on the steps. His armor was strange and ornate, each piece of steel intricately etched and filled with silver. The stranger looked at Keita's army and smiled. It was the protector of the law. He's 
not supposed to be here yet, Keita stammered. There's no way he can- The protector stepped forward directly into the mob. His movements were quick, difficult to follow, impossible to predict. Spears were thrust into the space he'd been filling, and rocks were hurled uselessly through the air. The protector took another step forward as the first wave of Keita's rebellion fell dead and dying behind him. Only a few seconds had passed. The rest of the mob didn't even know that there was a nightmare in their midst yet. But then the screaming began, and blood sprayed into the torches and burned, sizzling with that familiar smell. Arms and legs were separated, heads went rolling, and still the protector was untouched. Some tried to fight. All of them died. Others tried to run, and few of them made it. It wasn't a sword. It was like a farmer's sickle, and the castless were wheat. He walked through the trailing edge of the mob, only it was no longer a mob. It was a mass of severed tendons and broken bones. It was like the floor of Keita's butcher shop on the busiest day of the year, magnified and spread over the entirety of the master's grounds. Baldev was the strongest of them all. He roared as he swung his mighty hammer. The protector stepped aside and let it shatter the stone where he'd been standing. With barely even a flick of his wrist, Baldev's guts were suddenly spilled everywhere in a tangled purple mass. Govin struck with the overseer's whip. It was clumsy, missing the snap of the overseer's skilled touch. The protector merely caught the leather, tugged Govin toward him, and sheared the top half of the fisherman's skull off. Calm as could be, the killer strolled down the path, silver reflecting the light of torches dropped from nerveless fingers. And at that moment, the uprising against House Utara was broken. Keita's brothers dropped their tools and ran as if the sea demons had come to swallow their souls. Keita would not run. This was his doing. He lifted the meat cleaver in one shaking hand. Damn your law, he screamed at the protector. I will die a whole man. No. Ratul pulled Keita around to face him. Take this. He shoved a heavy bundle, wrapped tightly in oilcloth, against Keita's chest. Keep it safe. And go south to the ice coast. I can't. Ratul shoved him away with surprising strength. Flee, Keita the butcher. A new prophet has been called in the south to guide us. God will choose a general like unto Remroan of old to lead us. You will serve them both as they forge a true army. God will guide your path. I have seen it. Ratul reached down and picked up one of the fallen warrior's swords. He spun it smoothly once, as if testing the weight, and the old man did not seem unused to such an implement. Ratul began walking toward the approaching protector. It is time for our people to remember what has been forgotten. Keita watched, horrified, as the protector approached. He stopped several feet away from Ratul, and then did something that Keita had never seen or imagined he would ever see from someone of such high station. The protector politely bowed to Ratul. Greetings, Keeper. Good evening, Devadas. Ratul returned the gesture, as if he were an equal. I'd always hoped it would be you. The two lifted their swords, their stances a mirror image of the other. Keeter the Butcher ran for his life. He ran for hours, across rocks, down the beaches, through the tide pools shallow enough to be free of demons. When he didn't think he could run any farther, he ran some more, vomiting in the sand, but never slowing. When he thought his heart might burst, he still pushed on, terrified, afraid to look back toward bloody House Utara. He tripped and gashed his head open on the rocks, but he never dropped the heavy bundle Ratul had given him. When Keita could run no more, he collapsed into a quivering mass of burning muscle, 
crawled into the hollow of a tree and pulled branches and leaves over his hiding spot as the sun rose. He'd sleep during the day and run at night. There would be a purge. There was always a purge when the castless sinned against the law. Everyone he had ever known was dead, or would be soon. When he awoke hours later, Keita found that Ratul's bundle was still in his hand. The oil cloth had been wrapped tight and cinched with leather straps. Curious, he carefully unwrapped the package. It was a book, the thickest book he had ever seen. It was nothing like the plain things he'd stolen from the master's library over the years. This was bound in a thick black leather, unbelievably smooth when handled one way, but sharp enough to draw blood if rubbed against the grain. He'd heard of such a thing. This was the supposedly indestructible hide of a demon. Keita opened it hesitantly. Each yellowed page was magnificent, packed with letters so small he could barely make them out. They were names. The book was filled with names and numbers that had to be dates. Linking the names were lines. Page after page, there had to be as many names and lines as there were grains of sand on the beach. It wasn't that different from the ledgers he'd kept all his life. Only these were people, not supplies or animals. The master had such a thing for his house, a wall painted with the names of fathers and sons, stretching back for generations. The master called it a genealogy. Only that one had been insignificant in comparison to this. One page had been marked with a folded piece of parchment. That page said, House Utara, across the top. And it was dense with inked names and lines. He recognized many of the names. These were castless names. But it couldn't be. Each entry had two names. Non-people didn't get two names. Only whole men had a family name. The law did not allow the castless to have families. Castless were property, not people. Hesitantly, Keto traced his finger down the page until he found his own family name. Ram Rowan. Heart pounding, hands shaking, he closed the book, then wrapped it tightly in the oilcloth, extra careful to make sure it was sealed and the straps were cinched tight. Then Keita, keeper of names, began his long journey south. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Jakowitz. And a free upload of everything they've ever thought, dreamed, and written about the Leiden universe to a cloud server written down on a black hole event horizon that will make the information eternally saved, even though access might be a bit of a problem. Plus, thanks, praise, and plaudits to Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, authors of A Leiden Universe Constellation, Volume 4. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.